Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another day of the pandemic. Um, we're going to get started here in just a little bit with our first speaker, um, O, who is currently in uh, attendance as a student. Megan, can you please help out um, Josh? Yes, Megan is going to help you, Josh. Thank you. That explains some things. <laughs> Uh, while that's getting sorted out, I'll just, um, okay, I think that's getting sorted out, which is great. Um, just a reminder that your first assignment is due today and you'll have additional assignments following basically every day, so please stay on top of that. Um, I think we're all set now, so it is my pleasure to welcome Josh Sharfstein from um, the Johns Hopkins University. And he will be speaking about leadership manage and management in a public health crisis. Welcome, Josh. Thank you so, so much, Krista. It's great to be here. Um, and I look forward to, to talking with everybody today. I am going to share my slides. Is that OK? Let's see if I can get this to work. How's that? Does that work? Okay, good. Okay, so um, as Krista said, my topic is leadership and management in a public health crisis, which um, sometimes can seem like a theoretical topic, but these days does not seem like a theoretical topic, given that we're in the middle of COVID. Um, let me just say that um, I am a professor at Johns Hopkins in the public health school. I'm also a pediatrician, and I formerly uh, worked as the health commissioner of the city of Baltimore and the health secretary of the state of Maryland, responding to different public health crises. And I teach a course and wrote a book about public health crises even before COVID. So it's exciting in a way for me to be talking about public health crises when people are more interested in public health crises, although I don't in any way wish for public health crises. Okay, but I wanna take you back though to my first week on the job as the city health commissioner in Baltimore. Baltimore is a city not that different from St. Louis. Um, we have about uh, 600,000 people. And I um, came to the job as um, a pediatrician who had some policy experience and was really excited. And I told everybody that what I was gonna do when I started the job, very first thing on my very first day was start a listening tour, listening to what people were saying. But I didn't have a lot of time to do that because I walked into my office and the phone was ringing. And there was not a rabid raccoon in the health commissioner's office, if that's what you were thinking, yes. Um, fortunately, there was not. However, the phone was ringing. When I picked up the phone, it was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun. And the reporter said, um, there is a rabid raccoon running around the streets of Baltimore. And it knocked over a lady and it was growling in her face and it was like kind of drooling all over her and didn't bite her, but definitely exposed her to rabies. And your health department that you're now in charge of offered her the rabies shots to save her life. And those require shots over a period of time. And she got the first shot. And when she came back for the second shot on the deadline, there was no rabies vaccine to give her. So our question for you is, does the health department that you're in charge of give uh, promises for rabies vaccine, but not actually give rabies vaccine? And the second question for you is, is this woman going to get rabies? It was my first day, I still had my bag on my shoulder and I said four words that are very important words. Uh, maybe you've learned them in your own life. I said, um, I'll call you back. The next day in the newspaper, this was about 15 years ago, the health department was written up for citing, for giving tickets to college students who were giving individuals food who were homeless downtown. And the reason the health department that now I was in charge of, so think of yourself, you're in charge of the health department and suddenly the newspaper is saying, why are you giving tickets to college students just for giving food to people? It turns out they were violating some regulation that they needed to have hand washing. And their answer was, we make up the sandwiches 
in a, in a kitchen, we wrap them up and then we hand them out. Why do we need hand washing? It seemed like a pretty good argument. Um, and the students said that they would not obey, that they would tear up the tickets and they were gonna keep giving food. And this is a direct quote from the paper from some of the college students. If we have food, we're gonna feed them. If city officials were hungry and cold, I'm sure they wouldn't want someone to have a license just to give them something to eat. It's just stupid, that's what it is. And then still in my first week, we were ordered by the US Food and Drug Administration to stop all our research projects because we were supposed to have an oversight committee, but it had never really met and they didn't have minutes and nobody knew who was on it. And they said, this is not up to, to par. You have to stop all your research projects. And I said, well, it's a health department. We don't really do research. And they said, well, we have 60 research projects. All of our patients with HIV and tuberculosis are being treated on research protocols. So we'll have to stop treating them. So I was like, oh my God, that's, that's, that's terrible. Still in the first week, four people who were homeless died freezing cold on the streets of Baltimore. And it turned out our policy was we would only open an extra shelter if it was 25 degrees Fahrenheit and 15 mile per hour winds. And so a reporter said, that seems pretty cold. It was only you know, 30 degrees with no winds, but the, these four people died. Is your policy protective of health? So by that point, I said, um, I'll call you back. I knew what to say. And then finally, this is also in my first week, I realized that just a couple weeks from then, we were gonna have the implementation of the prescription drug benefit for older adults, for senior citizens in Medicare. That seemed like a good thing. People were gonna get access to prescription drugs, except part of that law was that people who were already getting prescription drugs through Medicaid would be switching to Medicare. You know, what's the big deal about that? Well, what I knew was Medicaid allowed older adults and people with chronic illness to get any medicine they wanted at any pharmacy they wanted. But then they were going to switch under Medicare where only some medicines would be available to them and only some pharmacies. So people could show up at their usual pharmacy and not be able to get their medicine for diabetes or schizophrenia or depression or something else and could cause a big crisis. So what I realized was my job was not gonna to be to lead listening sessions. This was all in the first week. That really, I was going to be dealing with crises of all kinds. And this is a little bit what it felt like um, in public health. So I wanna talk about what a crisis is and how you manage it well. A crisis, there are three definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary. A time of intense difficulty or danger, a time when a difficult or important decision must be made, or the turning point of a disease when an important change takes place indicating either recovery or death. That's, that's for those of you who are thinking about pre-med, that is um, a medical definition about in overwhelming infections. So used before antibiotics, people would either get better after a crisis or they would die from an overwhelming infection. And nonetheless, I like that third one the best because that's what it feels like. I define crisis, not just that there's a big problem, but that people really feel pressure to solve it. Um, for Sometimes it's just such a big problem, like coronavirus, you've got to solve it. But sometimes it's a relatively small issue, but you got to solve it. Like, you know, if I said, well, it's just one person, so she dies of rabies, you know, I would be fired in a second and it would really discredit the health department. So you've really got to fix that problem right then. So it was a mini crisis for me. So I want to talk about what it means to manage crises well, because I hope you get the idea. Crises are pretty common. You can manage them well. And if you manage them well, um, it's good for you. It's good for the public. Um, and you can use the skills managing littler crises for the big ones, including coronavirus. So I'm gonna talk about um, four areas of crisis management. Recognizing the crisis, managing the crisis, communication and politics, and then preventing the next crisis, which I think is part of the response. What you wanna do is prevent the next crisis. So let's talk about recognizing the crisis first. Why is recognizing the crisis the first part of a great crisis response? 
Because if you don't know you're in a crisis, then it's just going to keep getting worse until it's so bad that it could be really a huge problem. Um, you may think let's, and I'll, you know, pause to consider the coronavirus, how long it took different countries, including our own, to really realize what a serious situation it is. If we had realized that much earlier in January, when um, certain, certain people were saying it would go away completely, maybe we would have been better prepared. So the failure to recognize you're in a crisis is a fundamental, you know, uh, concern. And recognizing you're in a crisis is the key goal. Now, I learned this lesson because of a place called Swan Park. Swan Park is in downtown Baltimore. It is near the expressway. Um, it is a baseball field. And if they're history majors in the group, um, there is a baseball player named Al Kaline, played for the Detroit Tigers. He used to play in Swan Park when he was a kid. And one day, I was sitting at my desk very early on in my time as the health commissioner. And uh, everyone else had gone home from our health department. I was late. It's about to leave and the phone rang again. And this time it was um, a, a lawyer calling me from the city law office. And he said, Dr. Sharfstein, I'm so glad to reach you before I had to go home. I just wanted to tell you, there is nothing to worry about, um, about arsenic in the park at, at Swan Park. And I said, um, what's Swan Park? I didn't even know about Swan Park yet. I was so new in the job. He said, oh, there's this park downtown called Swan Park. Why would there even be arsenic in the park in Swan Park? Well, we were in the middle of litigation with this company that used to have a chemical plant right next to Swan Park. And we were looking at some 30-year-old documents. And in those documents, there was soil tests from Swan Park. And the normal level of arsenic in the soil is less than 20 parts per million, but we found more than that in Swan Park 30 years ago. Well, how much did they find? About 20,000 parts per million. So instead of less than 20, they found 20,000 parts per million. But don't worry, we've sent new test samples. The results will come back tomorrow morning. Our consultants here in the law office of the city say that there's no chance that it's gonna be high levels of arsenic. So no reason for you to worry tonight. So I hung up the phone. And a quick like a bunny, I called the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta because I knew they had an environmental health person on call. And I asked her, well, um, what do you think? And she didn't hesitate for a second. She said, you're going to have astronomically high levels of arsenic when you test get those results tomorrow morning. And I said, why is that? And she said, Josh, arsenic doesn't go anywhere. So then I hung up the phone. And I'm in this health department all by myself. And... I was getting so frustrated. I called um, a, a mentor of mine, Tom Burke at the School of Public Health. And he was a former New Jersey environmental health official. And I just wanted to get his advice. But when he, I heard his, his voice, I pretty much uh, broke down in frustration. And I was like, how is it possible they called the health commissioner last? Why couldn't they have told me a month ago? I can't believe this. It's, it's now 8 o'clock at night. At 9 in the morning, the results are going to come back. I had all these other plans for tomorrow. You know, do I count for nothing? And Tom basically um, said, uh, he's like the sweetest man. He said, get a grip. He said, you are the luckiest health commissioner on this planet. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you've got a 12 hour head start on a public health crisis. You know it's coming tomorrow morning. You now can prepare. And I, with his help, I brought other people back in from the health department. And the next morning, we had a problem. We had a sign. We closed the park. And we didn't just close the park and say we're there to protect the public. We used that situation to, to uh, launch some investigations of what went wrong. We published multiple um, papers about the problems in environmental policy. We worked with the state and with uh, universities for changes in policy. And it actually wound up really being an, uh, an interesting and important part of what we did to get people to realize about environmental hazards in their community. We did that all because I had the ability to recognize a crisis just a little bit early. Why is it so hard to recognize crises early? Well, one reason is, you know, you don't want to tell people bad news. So maybe uh, the, the president or others who are downplaying the risk of the virus, they're saying it's going to go away, the coronavirus, maybe they were just thinking, I really want to focus on the good news right now. Um, and 
there are the, related to this, there, there's a whole history of many crises that got a lot worse because people didn't recognize it. This is a picture of Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. And the um, a situation here was that there was a machine that was malfunctioning. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. People thought the machine was malfunctioning. There was a machine that was showing there was a big problem in the reactor. And everybody was going, the machine's malfunctioning. The machine always does this. They were like hitting the side of the machine. And all these people were staring at it and going, what's wrong with that dial? Something must be wrong with that dial. Nobody was thinking the dial is actually fine. There was a problem. And the entire core nearly melted down until someone else came in from home and said, hold on a second. I think that the core is going to melt down. It's not a problem with the dial. And so oftentimes, you know, something new comes up and you just want to believe that it's always going to be like it was before. That is a natural human instinct. And that keeps you from recognizing a crisis. Here's another challenge to crisis recognition and it's um, cultural bias. Now, in my classes, when I show this picture, I usually say like, what do you think of this guy? And people go like, oh, it's a, you know, middle-aged man. You might see him in the library, um, tapping on the computer, reading or something like that. So this is uh, Dr. Shipman, the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United Kingdom. He would go on call and kill his patients, hundreds of them. And when they went back and say, well, why didn't people recognize there was a problem? Well, there were people complaining. There were nurses complaining. People were saying like, something's seriously wrong. But then people go like, oh, that's Dr. Shipman. You know, so our biases um, can help us uh, to fail to recognize crises even as they're unfolding. And so by the time this actually happened, so many people were burned um, by their failures uh, to, to be responsive. There's also problems in recognizing crises because of poor information flow. And one summer in Paris, there was, it was so hot that thousands of older adults died in their apartments. And when they went back and said, why weren't you prepared? The health authorities said, we had no idea it was gonna be that hot. Of course, there were weather reports, but they never got that information where they needed it within their organization to be prepared. Finally, um, there's a challenge about, that I would call um, not my job that people sometimes are afraid to blow the whistle and say there's a crisis happening here because they're worried that they will get blamed or fired for bringing up bad news. And um, this is a pretty serious and common problem that organizations are not well prepared for recognizing crises because nobody wants to be the person blowing the whistle. And this happened in 1976 when there was a concern of a pandemic from swine flu and the government decided that they would vaccinate everyone in the country even when it became obvious this wasn't a good strategy people didn't want to speak up about it and the crisis happened um, as uh, the government was rolling out the vaccine program for a disease that no longer existed and uh, really damaged the vaccine effort. Some people were harmed by the vaccine and people realized it never should have been given. But all the pe people who were, um, uh, could have stopped it, they didn't want to because they thought that the decision had already been made. And so I think, you know, we think about the coronavirus, for a lot of these and other reasons, it was very hard for this country to recognize the serious situation. Um, and also China had trouble. Um, because it took a little bit longer there um, for them to see what the, what the challenge was and how serious it was. Many countries have had trouble realizing the scale of the coronavirus crisis. So now let's talk about managing the crisis. You finally figured out that there's a crisis. What do you do to respond? And the core principle for leaders here is that you need to act differently in a crisis. It's not the same as day-to-day -day management. You want a, a crisis management structure to actually do a good job addressing the crisis and not just rely on what you're doing. Now, that I have a picture of a uh, medical uh, situation here because this is analogous. It's an analogy to what happens in medicine when somebody's heart stops beating and they, they turn blue and somebody finds them they will um, not just page their primary care doctor or their hospital doctor, they announce code blue. So they may say code blue, room 242, code blue, room 7G, you know, wh whatever it is. And it goes over the loudspeakers or it goes on everybody's um, phone. And if you're nearby, you go running right there. 
and they're not waiting for the normal chain of command. They're, they're mobilizing a management structure just for this crisis. I remember the very first code that I was called to as a resident in pediatrics. And sure enough, they said code blue. It's very rare to have a code in pediatrics, but there was a code and it was right near where I was. And I was the second person there. And the first person there, I was just an intern in my first year. The first person there was a second year resident. So she was just one year older than me, but she was 18 inches shorter than me. She was very short, okay? And I had thought of her as just such a nice person, very sweet. She's, we're all pediatricians, pediatricians, very nice doctors in general. And I'd only known her as just very supportive. She jumped on a chair and said, I am the code leader. And she pointed at me and she said, you should immediately start chest compressions. And as all these people started coming in, she assigned them all jobs. She said, um, you're gonna be writing down everything that's happening. Uh, you're going to be drawing up the medicines that I want, you know, uh, one or 0.1 cc per kilogram of epinephrine or whatever, you know, she was giving out the orders. She had people checking oxygen. She was totally managing everything. Everyone knew their job. And at one point she said, you look tired from doing the chest compressions. Let's get someone else in there. And she was just totally organizing it. She was the code leader. She wasn't even that child's normal doctor in the hospital, but because she was there, they set up that process. That's the concept. You need something that's gonna manage the crisis effectively and not worry about what people's normal day-to-day -day jobs are. Some, one way of doing this is called incident command or incident management. And this is a concept uh, for management of a crisis that we're not talking about a code blue, but like a forest fire or a um, hurricane coming. It's a uh, way of thinking about it. And, but the concepts are similar. You have one person in charge and you assign roles, just like I was the chest compressions person. And let me just tell you that child survived. Um, uh, and uh, I never looked at uh, that doctor the same way again. I was very impressed. Um, with, with her ability to just take command of the situation. Um, similarly, you have one person in charge in an incident management system, and you build the organization based on what you need for this. Um, it addresses problems that can happen in a crisis. What can happen if you don't have a clear management structure? You have a lack of accountability, so nobody knows who's making decisions. You have poor communication. You have a lack of orderly systemic planning, so people are not planning for what could happen next. Um, and you basically um, have all types of confusion between agencies. People are showing up duplicating tasks, um, and that is the normal course of events unless in the middle of a crisis you can impose a good system of management. This is what a, a traditional incident command uh, kind of structure may look like. You have a commander, and that commander can change. Um, one day, maybe one person, another day, another person. Each of these are roles, not people. You have a public information officer who's gonna handle most of the communications. You have a safety officer to make sure people are safe in the response, a liaison officer to work with other levels of government, your operations section, which can have teams underneath or doing specific things. For example, you could have an operations section that is gonna set up, um, a, an approach to testing for the coronavirus around the country. You could have an operations section that's going to um, develop recommendations for um, control of the coronavirus. A planning section is gonna be gathering data and making plans. Logistics section will be helping the other sections with what they need to do their jobs. And then you're tracking that through the finance administration. You don't need all these different components. The principle is more important than the details here. You're setting up actions and you know who's responsible for everything. It's very important in management to know who's responsible. If five people feel half responsible, that's not as good as one person who feels responsible. Um, I used to work in the Obama administration and at one point um, the Obama administration was reviewing very troubled IT projects that had been around for a long time. And there was one of those at the agency that I worked at, the FDA. And I was asked to come down to the White House with the head of IT to defend whether we should keep getting money for this IT project. And I waited outside the room for an hour. It was very nerve wracking. We'd gone all the way down to the White House. 
we sat there and we came in and there was a um, team of IT experts who were reviewing all these trouble projects. And we sat there and the first question they asked was, who's the single person who's responsible for the success of this project? And our head of IT said, well, actually there are two of us. One of us works on the IT side, one of us works on the policy side and together we're a team. And they said, um, go back to FDA. We are canceling this project completely. We'll give you a, a seven day stay of execution. If you can come back here and tell us who the one person is, then we can hear out any other thing else you wanna say. We won't even listen to the which is coming next because you're set up to fail without a clear process for making decisions and having ownership. So. Um, if you think about coronavirus and our country's response, we have not set up this kind of system. It has been very chaotic at the federal level. And um, for that, I think personally, with my experience in crisis management and teaching about this, I think that's one reason we've had such a weak response in the United States. Let me just tell you that incident management and thinking like this can work for all kinds of different crises. And I'll go from the kind of... Uh, unusual to the global. So um, when I was a health commissioner, we discovered a unregulated um, like horse facility. What am I thinking? A stable, a big stable in downtown Baltimore. And so someone came into my office and they said, we found a big stable in downtown Baltimore. Um, and it turns out it's totally unregulated and they're getting an electrical hookup from three blocks away and it's a huge fire hazard and the firefighters found it and they've condemned the stable and all the horses need to be relocated within a day. And it's also um, the health department's responsibility because you have animal control. And um, the local news affiliate, um, uh, Fox News has found out about this and they're outside the office and want to comment from you. And I lit, took all that in and I said, there's a stable in downtown Baltimore? I had no idea there was a stable in downtown Baltimore. I generally was always getting informed about stuff. So like that was a crisis, like what do you do? And we uh, figured out that we could work with the people who had the horses, we could move them to Pimlico Racetrack in Baltimore, um, keep them safe and find another home for the horses. Um, and we used incident command, we had a commander, we had teams that were doing different things. And at one point, one of my, um, one of my uh, deputies said I could ride a horse down into the truck to take them to the racetrack. And it would be like an iconic image of someone in public health, but I think he was uh, just teasing me and I couldn't ride a horse, so I couldn't do that. But we were able to use an instant command in order to address this completely unpredictable situation. Now I wanna to go to the global. This is a picture of Tobot Nienswa, who is the uh, Assistant Minister of Health. He was a pretty young guy um, working in Liberia when the Ebola outbreak happened. And initially in the Ebola outbreak, um, there was uh, a disaster in Liberia. People questioned whether the government of Liberia would survive, whether the country of Liberia would survive. People were dying in the streets, People couldn't pick up the bodies. Doctors and nurses were getting sick and dying. And there was chaos at the organizational level. And um, President Ellen Sirleaf reached into the health department and called on Tolbert Nanswa and said, I want you to be the incident commander. And I want you to set up an organizational system just like this. And he did. He set that up. He paired domestic organizations with international organizations. He created teams around different things like burials and communication. And Liberia got control of its outbreak before any of those extra hospitals got fully built and utilized. Um, and they did that through strong public health work through management. So management really, really matters. Now let's talk about communication. So um, when you don't have a vaccine and when you don't have medications and you're in the middle of a crisis, communications is the vaccine, it is the medications. It is not just telling people, not like a running commentary of what's going on. Communications is part of the response because it's through communications that people understand what's going on and they learn how to protect themselves and their families. Communications is the life-saving intervention. It's not just telling people about life-saving interventions. And there's a great book that CDC had put together called Crisis Emergency Risk Communication. And that book has certain principles. Be first, 
if you are communicating in a crisis, you want people to turn to you because they know they'll get information from you first. Be right, which partly means be honest. So if it's not a good situation, don't say it's gonna disappear, be honest. And then people will, will believe you. Be credible, which means having spokespeople who know what they're talking about. Um, I don't think of anyone personally more credible on things like coronavirus than Dr. Fauci, if you, know, if you remember him. Express empathy, be human, talk about what this is, uh, means for individuals, promote action, tell them what they can do to protect themselves, and be transparent. So um, be uh, uh, clear about what's actually happening, share data so people can understand the situation for themselves. CDC also has advice on what not to do when you're communicating in a crisis. Don't have multiple people saying different things. Masks work, masks don't work, I won't wear a mask, you should wear a mask. Terrible messaging from the federal government on masks. Um, information released late, like you know, you're finding out way late about something. Paternalistic attitudes, you don't have to worry your head about it, we've got this. You know, that is not a message people like to hear. Public power struggles, it's not my fault, it's your fault. You know, it's this person's fault. That does not um, help people know what to do and not countering myths and rumors quickly. Um, when people um, are afraid, they'll la latch on to anything. It's really important to, and to, to address those things so that people don't do things that are actually harmful, like you know, drink bleach. Now, um, the way I think about this, and there's a good example in this book, imagine that somebody is sitting in their favorite chair, watching their favorite TV show, eating their favorite snack. And on TV, it says, there is a tornado coming. Run down to your basement right now to save your life. Okay, and the person's gonna stop. Go like, should I, should I get up and go down to the basement? But they might, what, what happens right then if they get a text message that says, there's a hoax about this tornado, don't pay any attention. And then they change the channel and somebody says, it's really hard to know whether tornadoes are coming at any point in time. And it's not a clear message to help people understand what to do. Most likely people will, will relax to what they're most comfortable with. And so when you have all these different messages about things, it can help explain why people don't really do what, for example, for coronavirus in other countries, everybody else is doing. So you have a lot of confusion about things like masks because of the, the various messages and the ways that it's been politicized and what people are saying. And in other countries, very consistent messages at every level on the value of things like masking or distancing or, or other, other key things. And people, when they do that, reduce the chance that the virus spreads. And it's one reason why the US has, has done so much worse than other countries. Let me just mention a little bit about politics here, just a bit, which is that um, it's very hard to divorce the crisis response from politics. And um, the story that I will tell from there is when I was the health commissioner, we had a kindergarten aide um, get sick of meningococcal meningitis and die. It's a terrible disease and it can be contagious and you have to get medicines to people as quick as possible who are close contacts in order to prevent them from getting sick. And so we had to find the kindergarten uh, students and pre-kindergarten students within um, 48 hours. And so we set up an incident command system. We had teams, we did everything right. We had great communication. We had a press conference. This is an article from the Baltimore Sun. Um, and we um, found every single child, even though it was over uh, the holiday, it was December 30th. Um, and then the next day I almost got fired. Now, why did I get fired? Krista, do you have any explanation for why I almost got fired? because the response from the public was negative and they didn't want this painted in a negative light, I'm guessing, I don't know. No, everybody was very happy. We actually announced we found all the kids. Nobody else was gonna get sick. A tragedy wouldn't become an outbreak. That was not why, why else? Who would have fired me? Who did I work for? Mm -hmm. I should know this. The city health commissioner worked for the mayor. Yes, the mayor. What would the mayor have been upset about? That you didn't give the mayor credit for this. 
exactly. I had done all this without the mayor being involved. That's a little bit of politics. Um, and I wrote the mayor back and I said, well, I, I let your office know. I let this person in your office know. And, and he immediately texted me back and said, do you work for that person or do you work for me? And I was like, uh-oh, you know. And so, you know, these things are kind of tricky and um, can be challenging in the moment. You have to be able to maneuver through people's different, you know, approaches, attitudes, understandings in order to be able to have an effective response. The key though is you don't want to change what's necessary to save lives in order to, um, uh, to get through the politics. The po when the politics make it hard to do what's right, that is a really difficult situation. So now let's talk about um, preventing the next crisis. So why should we even care about preventing the next crisis? And the answer is it may be the only opportunity to do so. Crisis creates a context in which challenges to existing norms and practices may be made. There is a long history of people wanting change, needing change, and nothing happens until there's a crisis and all of a sudden everything gets thrown up in the air and you get really important changes. So um, how do you do this? I'm gonna give you a case. This time I'm gonna put you at the state level. You're the Maryland Health Secretary. And one person dies and two people are hospitalized with flesh-eating infections after going li undergoing liposuction in a clinic in your state. Liposuction is like the cosmetic surgery. You send out inspectors and the inspectors find, and this is a direct quote, this is all true case, visibly dirty equipment, no separation of clean and dirty areas for equipment sterilization, a clogged sink in the liposuction room and it just gets more and more disgusting. So I'll stop reading. It's not a good situation. And you learn that this is not the only place that there have been people dying of cosmetic surgery and it's in part because states are not regulating cosmetic surgery. They're just waiting for problems to happen and then maybe they'll take away the doctor's license. They're not setting up any standards for these clinics to have to meet in advance that would help protect the public. And there's a big expose in USA Today about it. And you learn that in your state, Maryland, there's no extra regulation besides licensing the doctor. So you're, this happened in part because anyone could come in, set up a cosmetic surgery clinic and you'll only find out about it after there's a problem. And preventive standards could help. So um, what do you do? The key question here is not whether you shut down the facility, because you do shut down the facility. The key question is when you're shutting down the facility, do you say, we can do better? We can fix the law. We don't have to have this happen again. Now, most people will say, just shut down the center. That's the problem. Blame the doctor. The doctor was terrible and move on. But there was a problem. And you have the opportunity to focus people on the underlying problem. That's what we did in this case. I pointed out, even as we were closing the clinic, that we did not have the ability to protect people from this happening again. And I work with journalists and legislators. And we wound up getting a bill to actually regulate cosmetic surgery centers in Maryland. And I did this on many different topics. You know, I tried at least. And so the question that comes up when um, you have a crisis is what it will take to actually um, uh, to get change. And if you think about the coronavirus crisis, it has revealed a lot of fundamental problems. I'll just name a few. It's revealed that um, we have underinvestment in public health departments. We don't have good um, systems for public health um, in many places. It's revealed enormous racial and ethnic disparities in not just deaths from COVID and cases of COVID, but um, living conditions that contribute to that, overcrowding, transportation, protections for essential workers that have contributed to those problems. Um, coronavirus has also um, you know, revealed deep uh, problems in accessing healthcare for a lot of people. So we could just say, well, our goal is just to get the coronavirus to go away. Or we could say, let's take this as an opportunity to say, we don't wanna be vulnerable again, 
from these inequities and we should be thinking strategically about how to reduce them in the future. And so to be a real leader in crisis, to be a real effective manager of crisis, you're not just managing that crisis, you're pivoting to the solution that will save lives and address more underlying problems in the future. So I'm looking forward to your questions, but just to conclude, let's go back to my first week on the job and I'll just tell you what happened. You remember the rabid raccoon that was not actually in my office, but the phone was ringing and I said, I'll call you back. Well, I got everybody together in the health department and um, I asked them what was going on and they said, they, we've had a huge increase in rabies and we need to warn people about rabies. And by the way, we don't have enough of this vaccine because so many people are getting rabies. Most people can just get it at the hospital. Maybe we should just save our vaccine for people who are uninsured. So I said, okay, we'll change the policy to do that. And we work with the reporter um, and the lead story was rabies cases surge in city, serum supply tight. And so we got our messages out about how important it was for people to protect themselves. We were able to find the serum for this particular person and she never got rabies, which was good. So we, we, we dodged that and increased everybody's awareness. Do you remember the college students who were giving food to the homeless? Well, I immediately pulled everybody together and I said, what is going on here? And they said, those college students, they've been influenced by their professors. They don't know what they're doing. And I was like, I find that hard to believe. And so I called the president of Loyola and I said, I wanna meet the students. And we went all the way up there, my third day of work or something to Loyola. And I said, turned around to my staff before we went in. I didn't really know them. I was very young in the job. And I said, they need, the, let's listen to the students. Let's give them 85% of the time. If we're talking more than 15% of the time, we're talking too much. So we went in there and uh, one of the students said, you know, um, Mr. Health Commissioner, I have been going to school um, here for four years. I've lived in four different dorm rooms. I've had three different majors. I've, you know, done multiple different extracurriculars. Um, I uh, have had, you know, 10 different favorite foods. It used to be tofu, now it's the chicken that they serve, whatever it is. Um, and every single Monday night, I go to the same corner in downtown Baltimore and I give food to the same group of people who are homeless. And I've gotten to know them. And if you think with your stupid hand washing regulation, you're gonna keep me from doing that, you were wrong. I will go to jail before I stop doing that. Okay, and so I said to her that um, I admired her so much and that we wanted to support her and figure out a way to do that. And so we worked out a way to move the students just a block away with those same individuals to a church where we would set up supports for, um, for them. And um, uh, they, the student was quoted in the sun saying, this is a great solution, it's a step up because they're helping us connect our food program with getting people into services in the city. Interestingly, one of those students, this is what happens as you get older, um, later, fast forward 10 years, was the head of homeless services for the city of Baltimore. You remember when FDA said stop all the research projects? Well, we set up a quick pro pro project to look at all of our research. We figured out that um, we actually didn't need a review board, that they were all almost all approved by other review boards. We just had to sign affiliation agreements. So we were able to get through that with a quick um, management structure. If you remember the four people who were homeless, we found, we analyzed the data and found sure enough, people were dying at 32 degrees, no winds. And so we changed our policy and um, we responded by saying we were changing our policy. And interestingly, about six months ago, or maybe less, it was probably during the pandemic, I was walking around my neighborhood and one of my neighbors came out of the house and said, I just wanted to tell you, I remember 15 years ago when you changed that policy because my uncle was one of the men who died on the streets of Baltimore. And so, um, you know, using this moment to change policy, even back then, you never know. Um, what, what, what it can mean to people. And it was a very important uh, thing for us to do. Eventually we went to a year round shelter. Finally, you may remember the 20,000 or so chronically ill and older adults who had to switch prescription drug coverage and they wouldn't know whether it was the right medicines or the right pharmacies. And um, what we did was we set up an emergency system where any pharmacy 
could call us 24 hours a day and we would pay for medicines in, if, in the case that people would not um, have them. We basically treated this as a crisis and an emergency. And initially people said that we were like chicken little, it was gonna be fine. But what actually happened was that the whole system crashed. All these people couldn't get their medicines and only us, only us, uh, only the group in Baltimore had, was ready for this. And so I wound up on NPR and on the front page of all these stories. I was two weeks in the job as health commissioner and I had um, all this national exposure for being ready to respond to um, a prescription drug issue like it was an emergency and treat it like a crisis and be able to help people in my state. And so that's why I'm so passionate about the idea that you can manage crises well, you can lead through crises well, because it played such an important role in my own career. So my conclusion is that crises come in all shapes and sizes. You can um, develop the management tools to, uh, to um, manage them well and use that to change things. And I think um, on many of these uh, points, I, I would say I do not give very high ratings to our response to the coronavirus, um, nor did my students. When I last taught this course, it was in February and March, and the last class was by Zoom because we'd shut down the university. And I invited a Washington Post reporter, and he showed up and he said he would be quiet, but wound up asking all the students what they thought based on what they had learned in my class. And the students basically said, well, what Dr. Sharfstein teaches, none of that's happening right now. Um, people are not taking it seriously enough. They are not setting up the right management structure. They are not starting to think about the underlying structural issues to address. And so um, that was the con consensus. So, so I'm hopeful um, that one way or the other, we will start to get to a better and more effective crisis response for the coronavirus. I'm um, using some of the principles that I've talked about today. So with that, Krista, I'm open to whatever questions people might have. Great, thank you. That was wonderful. And I'm so glad that you went back to those original stories because a lot of the questions coming in were about how you resolved those. And I, I think that was such a useful way to show how this can be done well. Um, and I, I have to say, I am, I, you have a lot more experience than me at this sort of uh, speaking to a large audience. So I completely froze when we had tech issues <laughs> earlier and I didn't do a proper introduction of you, but I did want the students to know that um, Dr. Sharfstein is also an author and has books that you may want to check out. The Public Health Crisis Survival Guide, I think is very relevant to what we're talking about today. Thank you. You put this up there. Wow. See, I need to learn how to multitask. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. I think uh, one of the topics that a lot of the student questions touched on is this idea of having one leader who makes the decisions and makes sure everything is being handled. Um, so given the current pandemic and given that we are in a country that has a bunch of state governments, local governments, and then the federal government all coming up with different responses to this, who should be the one person in charge in this case? Should it be one person per state or one per person for the nation or how does that work? Sure, so I think for the national response, there should be someone clearly in charge. And I don't mean the president, no matter who the president is. Um, I think it should be somebody who is uh, trusted um, and who's knowledgeable. And that person should, um, and you know, there could be that person is allowed to take a vacation, you know, or take a day off. So there could be more than one person on any day. There's somebody who's very clearly in charge and you have a structure for what the national government is gonna be doing. Similarly, at the state level, that is sort of the umbrella. You will have someone similarly, I think, in charge at the state level and at the local level. And those people should all be working together. I think the job of the national government in this situation is to provide critical resources, guidance, and uh, data and data analysis to support um, a really robust response. And we could take an example. Um, let's take the example of opening schools. Right now, it is very chaotic what's happening. There is not a very clear message from the federal government and people are going in all sorts of directions. Now, I don't think there necessarily needs to be a one size fits all approach, but there should be much better and more clear guidance from the federal government and there should be regular reporting. Everybody should be able to, you know, look at a dashboard and learn about what's happening in their area and how it compares to other areas and people should be researching to say, well, this school system or this university did this and it worked. 
This other one did that and it didn't work. So here's a new set of recommendations. Basically, we should have an environment the federal government creates where we're using data and science to continually improve the response. And the job of the local officials is to customize that for their particular area and to implement it effectively. That's great. A lot of the other questions revolved around how do you decide what to prioritize? Because obviously, as you've described, it's a new crisis every day. Um, and in this pandemic, there are so many different issues. And so these questions came in multiple forms. Like, for example, if you have a limited supply of ventilators or PPE, how do you decide who gets those? When you have uh, a lot of needs of a community, how do you prioritize those needs? Um, that is very challenging. Uh, it's very challenging. So let's get, take a, a couple examples. And, you know, basically, it depends how much time you have. And it depends, um, you know, uh, at what level you're, you're working. Right now, we have to decide about how to prioritize vaccines. And so there is a, a group that is going to be having public meetings of very uh, smart and thoughtful people that was convened independent of government by the National Academies that's gonna be making recommendations about that. And I think that's a good place for that to start. So if you have time for a very difficult question, you could get people who are trusted in a community to come together and uh, think about it and make recommendations. That, that's one way to do it. Now, if you don't have time, you have to um, be transparent and explain what you're doing. You know. Here's, you know, we're, we're, we're making these decisions because we have to make the decisions now. Um, here's the basis of the decision that we're making. And here's how we're going to assess whether, whether it's working and when we're going to reconsider. Or here's how we're going to go out and be honest about, you know, whether it's working and get, get ideas about what we could do better. So I think it really depends a little bit on the decision, how much time, but there are ways to do it where you can have uh, more credibility. Thank you. And other students were wondering about, you know, you're talking about all of these challenges. In your opinion, what do you feel like is the biggest challenge when you're doing this sort of work or what's the most difficult part of it? Well, um, there the obviously, it can depend on the, on the situation. Um, I'll tell you the most difficult part of it for me. You know, I feel just an immense responsibility there's some things that are part under your control and some things that aren't and some things will go well and some things that won't. And, you know, maybe you, you, you played a big role or maybe you didn't, but um, personally, I always felt an enormous responsibility. And when things didn't go well, I would feel really bad. That was the hardest, you know, yeah. even if people were to say like, you couldn't have predicted that there's something you could do. There was somebody who didn't help. There was whatever. I always felt a lot of responsibility, but I think in feeling that responsibility, I was always my own toughest critic. And um, I, when things went well, I didn't feel like I, I, was, I was able to share. I, I certainly didn't hog the spotlight, but I, I got a sense that, um, that it was uh, a real team effort. And it's really a special thing to be a part of when you come together for a crisis that really matters for people. And you can look back and say, wow, we didn't have any child you know, who didn't get the medicine, or we didn't have anyone in this hurricane who didn't get their dialysis treatment, or we, you know, with Ebola, we didn't let Ebola spread at all, or whatever the particular issue is, it's a great feeling. So, um, uh, so, so this, that for me was personally, personally the hardest. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's too bad that the mayor doesn't realize that you're not trying to steal the spotlight. <laughs> I know. Oh, I felt bad. I, it was weird because you start and you go like, oh, I don't, if it, this could all go bad. I don't want the mayor to get in trouble. But I will just say that in my career, the, I've always had a harder time with success than with failure. With failure, I'm always my, my harshest critic. With success, suddenly all these people say, how come you didn't include me? What do you do? It's, and you just have to be able to say, I'm so sorry. I will do it next time. I will do it. And then you include them next time, but then there's somebody else. So it's, yeah. it's uh, you just, you know, have to give yourself a little bit of a break. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, that, I was joking. I think also the students questions, the, the questions that are coming in about that part of your talk are clear, clear that they support you and they are ready to come to your defense. Oh, that's good. That was a long time ago. And the mayor read my book when I wrote about that. And he called me up and he said, did I really say that? I guess I did. That's what he said. So we're, we're very close. The mayor. That's great. Um, so do you think, how do you think the Obama administration, I don't know if this is a fair question, but a lot mm -hmm. of students want to know, how do you think the Obama administration would have handled this situation? 
Um, well, you know, it, it's hard to completely play that game, but I know that, um, and of course I'm hardly unbiased because I was part of the um, Obama administration at the beginning. Um, I think that uh, there, were, th there were a few really important things. First, let's go through the four things, recognizing the crisis. The Obama administration had a lot of paranoid people about pandemics, and that's why they wrote up a plan. Um, they were doing, and I'll tell you, the Bush administration was very paranoid about pandemics. I think the Bush administration would have done very, very well. In fact, I was um, the beneficiary when I was at FDA because we turned around a vaccine very quickly for H1N1, a different pandemic, because the Bush administration had invested in extra flocks of chicken um, to make eggs for the flu vaccine. When I testified before Congress, I said, for these chickens, this is their moment. But it was their moment, and we got a vaccine in record time. We'd have a vaccine by October. Um, and then, um, so I, I think that they would have recognized it much, much faster, um, as yes. was the Bush administration. Then you have management. Um, and I think it, it probably would have depended a little on when this hit during the Obama administration, at the very, very beginning, I would say. Um, Took a little while to get organized on H1N1 because people were just getting going. But if you go later and you look at Ebola or some of the other crises, the, the administration was very well organized. And uh, someone like Nicole Lurie, who is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, she knows how to run an incident command management. Um, that would be the understatement of the year. So I think the, or the organization would have been much better. And as a result, we'd have seen more attention to some of these testing problems, more attention to the recommendations. CDC would have been much more involved than it eventually was. Um, on communication, I think it would have been much more clear. I, I don't think you would have seen um, anyone in the Obama administration tweeting um, things like Dr. Fauci is lying, you know, I think that, um, or writing op-eds like that. Like personally, I'll just say, I just think it's appalling how pu pu uh, public health officials have been attacked for saying things that are true. So I think we would th that would have been uh, very different. And then the pivoting, I think, um, finding those underlying structures, I think, I think that that, that uh, hopefully will happen no matter what. I um, mean, I hope that whoever is looking at this is able to look at some of these uh, critical issues. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate egg laying chickens for many reasons in science. So I'm happy to hear they had their day. Um, so I think we just have a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask you if you have any final words of advice. Are there things that you want the students to make sure they're thinking about and doing as we move forward in this pandemic? Well, um, I think it's really important for people to be aware at multiple levels of what's happening, not just what's recommended, but I think now that you're in school to really be thinking about, well, should, did this make sense what this person said? You know, would I have done it this way? To ha have sort of a running narrative in your, to yourself about what could have been done differently and, and then, you know, circle back as you see what the results are. Um, that's how you, you develop you know, your own judgment about things. And this is a big area. It's gonna affect all of our lives for the foreseeable future. And um, developing your own judgment is gonna, gonna serve you well. I think it's great that you're doing this course um, and uh, I wish you all the best. And when you're ready to go to graduate school in public health, look me up. Um, you, everyone can join me and join my mom and her three closest friends on Twitter if you want. Um, and uh, you'll be like my fourth and fifth followers. But if you uh, don't want to do that, that's totally understandable. Um, but please don't, you know, my, all my information is easily available online. And uh, someday, if you think about public health, uh, track me down. That's amazing. Thank you so much. A lot of the students actually had questions about your career path and whatnot. So I think that you have just opened yourself up to receive a lot of emails. Thanks, Thank guys. you so much for your time. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Krista. Yeah. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, perfectly on time. Um, we are now going to move on to our second speaker of the day. Dr. Jeffrey Zacks is in the Department of Psych Psychological and Brain Sciences at Washington University. Um, he is going to be talking about understanding processes like pandemic growth when learning from graphs, tables, and descriptions. And we will also have time for questions after his talk. Welcome, Dr. Zacks. Good to be here, thank you. Can you hear okay? Okay, awesome. Um, 
Yeah, so as Professor Millich said, I'm in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. I'm really happy to be with you today. Um, my lab studies cognitive neuroscience. We're interested in how people understand and remember our complex everyday world. We do this using lots of different kinds of media, movies um, uh, and things like graphs and tables. Um, we study things including healthy young adult cognition and perception, aging, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I'm also a faculty fellow. I'm talking to you today from uh, Elliott Hall on the South 40. And I noticed uh, one or two of my Elliott uh, friends on the, on the chat, on the Q and A, so shout out to them. Um, and I hope that, you know, at some point we're able to sit down over a meal in the bear's den and talk about some of these things. Today, um, what I wanna talk about is how we understand information about growth processes of which uh, pandemic virus is a salient example. So a lot of us this year have been spending time looking at depictions of growth processes like this one. These are all data from Tuesday. So this is from the New York Times showing um, uh, cases per day in the US. We cannot see the screens yet. Oh, those slides thank you. Yet. Ah, okay. Back up. How about that? All right, thanks. Okay, so, so here's New York Times, um, cases per day uh, as of Tuesday. Here's the Washington Post, similar data for a few states. Here's a different kind of visualization. This is USA Today. Um, plotting a map showing the density of recent cases across the U.S. And what I want to uh, ask today is when we're informed about a growth process uh, by a graph or a table or a verbal description, what is it that we understand and how do we understand it? Um, and this is important in part because Early in the pandemic, lots of us, um, including policymakers and those in government, failed to appreciate how a small number of cases could quickly become a huge number of cases. And I wanna suggest some reasons why that might be the case. Let me motivate this, some, of, some of this with a fable. Um, there's a story that in uh, the early Chinese imperial government, uh, a young minister in his 20s moved to the capital to take a job. He bought a villa. The villa had a pond, and he thought it would be aesthetic for there to, to plant some duckweed in the pond. Um, and so he did, and over the years, as his career blossomed, he watched the duckweed grow, and when he retired at 70, he had this pond that was maybe a quarter covered with duckweed, and he looked forward to enjoying that view in his retirement. And then he watched as the duckweed just kept growing and it grew faster and faster and faster. And within a year or two, the pond was 100% covered with duckweed um, and he had to take on some eradication. Um, psychologists have studied analogs of this in the laboratory. So here's an adaptation of a visualization. So imagine that I bought a very square pond and I, uh, planted one corner of it with duckweed. And now we're gonna start a clock. You'll see the frame count up there in the upper left. And at first there's not much happening and then it starts growing. And so my career is going along in the Chinese capital and the duckweed is growing. And we'll just watch it grow for a little bit. Okay, we'll stop it here. And in case it was jaggy on your screen, I can plot you a graph of, um, what this looks like. It turns out we get the same kind of judgments from people, whether we show it as an animation or a plot a graph like this. Um, and so time here is running along the x-axis uh, and um, the percentage of the pond that's filled is running along the y-axis. And the question is, at what point is the pond going to be completely full? Um, and so I won't collect data, but let's just, let me just ask you to answer for yourself. Would you say that it's gonna be around point A or point B or point C or point D. Now, when I look at this, 
my visual brain wants to kind of extrapolate smoothly from the end of that curve. And it looks to me like somewhere around C, you know, like maybe A and B are too conservative, but somewhere, and it looks like it's growing pretty fast. So maybe somewhere around point C uh, is where it's gonna be fill, filled. But in fact, and, and, and C is what most people tell us, but in fact, it's, it's point B. It's about twice as fast as it looks to our visual brains. So early on in the pandemic, um, understanding what was going on required appreciating exponential growth from graphs and other sources. And it turns out this is really hard. And this is true for both perceptual and conceptual reasons. And so I'm gonna talk about some limitations on our perceptual abilities and some limitations on our conceptual issues. And don't worry, I'm gonna start with the limitations, but the message here is not that we are flawed and stupid and we can never solve these problems. We'll come back around to the upside at the end. So let's first talk about some limitations. One limitation um, is that we're subject to perceptual illusions. So here's a plot depicting the grayness of uh, Canada and America. And you can see that Canada is a lighter gray and, uh, America, and the US is a darker gray as indicated by these circles. However, if I connect the circles, you can see that those two grays are actually identical. Um, they appear different when they're unconnected. And you can't unsee this just by knowing that they're the same. They really appear different because um, of contrast. So this circle is surrounded by a darker background. This circle is surrounded by a lighter background. And so we, the brightness that we perceive depends on the surround. And this is really tricky when we're plotting real data. If you think about this map from USA Today, the local surround depends on the data that we're trying to visualize. So we have to be able to come up with visualizations that are gonna be robust against those kinds of contrast illusions. Here's a bar graph um, and it's, you know, like many bar graphs that we might see, you might wonder why I would plot pairs of bars leaning in toward each other rather than just plotting straight bars, right? Um, in fact, each pair, all those bars are straight. They just look like they're leaning because of a local spatial contrast between the fill pattern and the contours. So pattern lines can look bent and there are lots of local um, spatial location and shape contrast illusions. And so we have to worry about those kinds of things when we're thinking about data visualization. Um, here's a pair of plots, uh, a plot showing a pair of exponential growth processes. And it seems pretty clear to my eye and brain that what's happening is that the lighter curve is jumping up much more quickly than the darker curve. But in fact, that's not what's happening at all. The two curves rise at the same rate. It's just the onset that is shifted. Um, it looks like they're rising at different rates because when we get to the end of the data here, this one's lower. And when we're measuring the um, shapes and distances of objects, what usually matters is the closest distance, not the, the distance in the horizontal direction or the vertical direction. And so our visual brains are optimized for making a different judgment than the one that's relevant here. And the general finding is that parallel curves can appear to be not at all parallel. Um, our visual brains are influenced by previously learned expectations. So in one set of studies, we showed people simple bar graphs like this. So this is plotting um, the height of, oops, the height of um, two groups, 10 year olds and 12 year olds. And age is of course a continuous dimension, but we have a lot of experience with bar graphs and our Brains have learned that what we usually do with a bar graph is make a comparison between two data points. So when we show these to people and ask them, these are college students at a selective university, ask them to make, to just describe in a sentence what's going on in the graph, we often see statements like 12 year olds are taller than 10 year olds, whereas you might want to think about this in terms of age increases with height. Now that's not so pernicious because 12 year olds are taller than 10 year olds is certainly a true thing that this graph is showing. 
But now consider a case where we flip it. Here we're showing a discrete underlying dimension, females and males, um, and again, we're plotting height on the axis. It turns out that when we show people these kinds of graphs, what our brains have learned is that we um, usually want to extract the trend over the horizontal dimension. And we actually get, again, at a selective private university, a substantial number of people saying things like, the more male you are, the taller you are when they see graphs like these. So we're strongly influenced uh, in the messages that we take away from a visualization by our previous experience. And this can really impair our judgment. I'm just presaging for a second what I'm gonna come back to. You know, this is, in this case, this is a gotcha. But the, but the reason that our brains work this way is that most of the time it's a good thing to do. If the designer is smart and cooperative, then the message that's naturally gonna, naturally gonna come out is gonna be a helpful message. But we as designers and communicators need to think about these things. Okay, here's some things that are trickier to get around. One is that you know we have finite memory, of limited memory. So suppose that I show you a pie chart like this and I ask you which country produces more widgets, Greece or Denmark? In order to answer that question, what you have to do is first consult this legend here um, and then uh, access the color that matches that legend, then find the corresponding uh, wedge over here. Then you got to do the same thing again for Greece and find the corresponding wedge and then you've got to keep those in mind and compare them and then that, that's a lot of work and people are pretty slow. Worse yet, if I were to ask you a more integrative question like who generally produces more widgets, Northern or Southern Europe, it would be just brutal with a visualization like this. Um, there's a lot of ways that we could make this visualization better, but one simple one is just to reduce that memory load by co-locating the labels with the data instead of forcing people to use a legend. So you don't have to go back and forth. You don't have to use your working memory to hold on to that information. Another limitation is an attentional uh, limitation. Um, picking off individual points is generally fast and parallel, but making comparisons is slower and has to be done often one at a time. So if I were to ask you something like, where's the tallest bar? It's really easy to figure out that that's um, uh, here for item five. So suppose that these are subjects in a clinical study. So we could say that subject five has the tallest bar. But if I were to ask you, which is the subject for whom the treatment was lower rather than higher than the control? You can find it with a little bit of searching. It's over here, number seven, uh, but that's gonna take some work. Whereas if we take the differences between each of those two bars, then you can find that quickly. So some limitations are that we're subject to illusions, limited memory and limited attention, and we're influenced by our expectations from previous graph experience. Okay, now let's switch gears and talk about um, conceptual limitations particularly about exponential growth processes like, um, like a pandemic virus. I wanna return for a second to the duckweed example. So here's this pond filling in uh, with duckweed and it's, it's currently at the aesthetic stage. Um, and many growth processes that we experience are basically linear in their um, growth. They're accumulative processes. So here's a couple examples, oops. Um, on the left, there we go. On the left is uh, snow accumulating in a storm in Connecticut last year. On the right is somebody pouring water, make coffee. And there's some variation, it gets faster and slower, but basically the rate at which the thing increases is roughly constant. And we have lots and lots of experience with growth processes like this. Exponential growth processes which characterize multiplying organisms are unusual in nature. Totally natural, but they're not the more frequent case. And so what happens uh, that is so strange about exponential growth is that over time, the rate of growth increases. And worse yet, not only does the rate increase, but the rate of increase of the rate of increase uh, grows. And this is challenging for our conceptual systems to wrap our heads around. When we're making predictions about what's gonna happen, they tend to wanna to refer to the more frequent cases. 
So when we think about exponential growth, what we do is we tend to anchor on estimates from linear growth. We tend to look at what happened recently in the curve and then figure that the future is gonna be roughly like the past was. And this is another one of these things. It's not a bad thing for our conceptual systems to do in general, but it can lead to really pernicious errors. So here's a classic study uh, that looked at these effects of anchoring on judgment. Um, in this study, uh, Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman um, asked people about the percentage of countries in the UN that were African nations. And before they asked the question, they spun a spinner like a roulette wheel, except for their spinner had 100 numbers on it. And the spinner was set so that it randomly stopped at either 10 or 65. And they went through this elaborate demonstration with the spinner just to make it really clear that the spinning of the spinner had nothing to do with the question. It was totally uninformative. So they spin the spinner, and then they ask people what proportion of nations in the UN are in Africa. And if the spinner had just stopped on 10, the average estimate was 25%. Whereas if it had just stopped on 25, the average estimate was almost twice as high. Okay. So clearly what people were doing was pulling a, a number out of the air, whatever number was handy. And then they were thinking, well, that number's really not right. So I'm going to adjust, but they don't adjust enough. Yeah. In case you're wondering, the correct answer currently is 28%. Okay. So things that have nothing to do with the question at hand can serve as anchors that can bias our judgments. Um, Often this is fine, but often it can be, but sometimes it can be pernicious. Another thing that's often fine, that can, but that can also be pernicious is our friends and neighbors and the people that we hear from. So social influences are often really helpful aids to reasoning, right? Asking knowledgeable sources or friends that I can trust can be a valuable way of guiding my decision making. But when those sources are unreliable, it can be pernicious. So this is another absolutely classic study from Solomon Ash. And what Ash did was presented people with pairs of cards like this and said, which bar in the card on the right matches the bar uh, in the card on the left? And it's very straightforward. It's the one on the left. But he did this in groups. And unbeknownst to this poor guy um, right here, I guess he's what sixth in line at the table. The first five are all confederates of the experimenter. And so they all choose uh, the middle bar, the tallest bar. And you can see this guy looks pretty uncomfortable at this point. And, um, and what happens is that a surprisingly high uh, percentage of the time, people wind up choosing um, the bar that, that, that their colleagues chose. So we can be influenced, it can be very, very uncomfortable when your judgment uh, fails to conform with the social norm. So to summarize on conceptual uh, limitations, exponential growth mismatches our default reasoning modes. It's just not the typical thing that we see. And because of that, we tend to anchor on what was happening recently in that curve and think that it's go what's gonna happen in the future is gonna correspond to our general, more general experience. Uh, that is, it's going to be closer to linear. So going back to that ABCD choice I gave you with the duckweed, what we tend to do is our gut, our quick, fast thinking tells us it's going to keep growing linearly. We know that can't quite be right. So we adjust somewhat, but we fail to adjust enough. And so things that and what happens with exponential growth is it's kind of nothing, 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 then boom, it takes off. And that boom is always going to catch us flat-footed unless we use conceptual aids to improve our decision-making. Okay. Like I said, it's by no means all bad news. Um, uh, humans are actually uh, pretty smart. Um, our visual systems themselves are just incredibly powerful. Let's look at another map display here. So this is... Um, a uh, map from the US, again, these are data from Tuesday showing the density of recent coronavirus cases across the US. And in a fraction of a second, you can look at a complex visualization like this and appreciate that there are swaths of the mountain states where there are very low rates, 
and then that there are higher rates in a little bit of the West Coast and a lot of the South and Southeast. And um, if you're interested in a particular area, you know, a lot of us uh, are thinking right now about, um, about Missouri and Illinois, or you might be thinking about your home county or your home state. Even though there are thousands of counties depicted here, it's pretty easy to pick out a couple and zoom in on that information. So we can make lots of complex um, judgments and comparisons from a visualization like this, and we can do it rapidly and, and we can do it mostly accurate. So our visual brains are very powerful. And at a conceptual level, we're smart. We're not, you know, we're subject to these illusions, but it's not that we're dumb. We can do all these amazing things. We can remember huge amounts of factual information and episodic information about things that happen in our lives. Um, we are, you know, champions amongst the species of the earth on these dimensions. When we're responding, just walking down the street in a complex environment when there's people in traffic and, uh, and scooters and skateboarders around, that's an incredible feat of information processing in real time. And we can do that stuff and we can pick out rapidly the source of a voice that calls out to us and we can track complex information in our environment super well. And when it comes to making judgments about things like, um, uh, like the growth of a pandemic, we can improve our decision making to overcome some of these naturally occurring obstacles. One powerful way to do that is to learn new cognitive aids. So here's one more graph showing um, pandemic growth in the way that we usually show it. So these are data from Turkey um, plotted for the beginning of the year. So there were no, no zero, zero, zero cases, then there was one case and then it shot up, okay. And looking at the beginning of this curve, it's really, really difficult to figure out what's going on. But one thing that we can do is instead of plotting the frequency of cases, we can plot the inverse of that. We can plot how many people for each infected case are uninfected. So one way to think about this is that the beginning of the pandemic, there were no cases in Turkey for a while, and then there was one case. So basically, um, all of a sudden you've got one individual who's surrounded by a nation full of uninfected people. And then just 10 days later, there's one case per 124,000. So that uninfected individual is surrounded by a small city of 124,000. And then 10, 10 days after that, uh, we're down to one case per 6,000. And so that uh, individual is surrounded by a small village. Um, and when, when people learn to use visualizations like that, they think about the early stage of these processes quite differently. Um, a great, uh, um, oh, and I should credit, those, those data all come from uh, the wonderful center at, at Hopkins where Professor Sharfstein comes from. Um, also using those data, uh, Wade Fagen Olmschneider uh, at the University of Illinois has developed uh, what I think is a really helpful visualization. Again, it's based on the inverse. So um, what he does here is use icons to represent um, in a hypothetical pop, conceiving of America as a group of a thousand people. How many people uh, recently have had positive tests? How many people have recovered? How many people have died? Uh, how many people have negative tests? And then uh, how many have just not been tested at all? And this gives you a very intuitive snapshot. I think it's a conceptual tool that gives you a very intuitive snapshot of what's going on um, at a given moment in time in a given nation. And in particular, it helps you know, keep in mind the proportion in the US that are still untested. So if we let our fast moving um, information processing brains take a break, if we intervene and stop and reflect, then we can use valid reasoning methods that overcome some of the perceptual illusions and some of the cognitive illusions like anchoring or social influence um, and uh, achieve better uh, reasoning. And this point about uh, the nature of these cognitive illusions and how we can overcome them 
uh, was brought into psychology and economics by uh, Tversky and Kahneman, shown here. Um, Amos Tversky uh, is since deceased, but uh, Danny Kahneman, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for this work a few years back. And he wrote a great book about these issues called Thinking Fast and Slow. And Michael Lewis uh, recently wrote a wonderful book about their uh, work together called The Undoing Project. I recommend both of those. Um, I want to consider one last cognitive aid uh, that was useful to a lot of us um, in February, March. This is a set of simulations that were developed by um, uh, information data scientists at the Washington Post. And um, by now you've probably learned something about uh, epidemiolo epidemiological models, and we can use those to generate graphs and to make predictions and stuff. One powerful way to use those models is to generate illustrative simulations that help use our visual brains to drive accurate intu intuitive judgments about what's going to happen. So what they do here uh, is have a hypothetical population of uninfected people in one infected case, and everybody's moving around randomly, and each time they bump into each other, uh, they if they're infected, they transmit. You can see the um, rate of cases rising, and uh, eventually uh, the, the pond fills with duckweed, right? Unlike the duckweed example, um, the pond's eventually gonna clear because people get better. And one thing that they did as mercy in this is not consider the cases of people who don't get better and, and, and die from the disease. Um, so you can see how you go rapidly from a situation where there's just nobody or a couple of cases wandering around to this rapid growth phase. And then you can also use these models to illustrate uh, the effects of various interventions. So um, here what they're, here what they're showing is the effect of quarantines. Quarantines seem really attractive uh, to some folks early in the game. And if you have a perfect quarantine as illustrated here, of course that is uh, effective. But if you have just a small leak in the quarantine, what this model shows is that all you can do is push off the onset of this ra rapid growth phase and you're still gonna uh, wind up with everybody getting infected and the system being overwhelmed. Whereas if you reduce the transmission rate through effective or even partial social distancing, you not only slow down the onset, but um, you can control the total number of people who are infected at the maximum. So here they model that by just freezing a bunch of the dots. And what this does, this is like social distancing. And what it does is dramatic, even though it's not a perfect intervention, dramatically slows down uh, the growth rate. So we can use these tools like the math itself or these visualizations derived from the math to help us make more effective decisions. So, you know, to summarize the good news part of the story, what I want to say is that our visual systems are just incredibly powerful. And if we use them right, we can um, uh, reason quickly and effectively about vast amounts of information. We can design effective visualizations. We can train ourselves to think systematically about growth processes by using formal reasoning and using uh, models. And this is an example uh, in part of uh, what Kahneman calls thinking fast and slow. We have these rapid automatic intuitive modes of uh, thinking that are effective in lots of situations but can lead us astray. And if we stop, we can override those and reason more effectively. And we can also develop uh, cognitive aids uh, that improve our decision-making performance. So I'll stop there and leave it uh, for questions. I do just want to say that, like, um, all the stuff that I that I've been talking about, and and the more broadly the things that we think about in the lab, it's very collaborative, and uh, none of the ideas that I described today are particularly original to me. They're the result of a group collaboration that involves the people in the lab and, and scientists at lots of other institutions. Wonderful, thank you so much, that was great. Um, so we have a lot of different questions. Um, 
a lot of them center around the idea of what causes us to have like how is our is our mind conditioned for this somehow and is it the way we're taught in school is there a biological component is there a social or cultural component and then if so does that mean that actually in different cultures people perceive these things differently yeah yeah there's there's really two great questions there so one is like how baked in is this stuff um and i think it's helpful to think about a range of mechanisms with different time scales so some features about how we judge things are built into our brains by um, evolution. So um, some of them are so basic that you don't even think about them. Like um, uh, when I teach introductory cognitive psychology, I try and get people to think uh, about a two-dimensional shape or a three-dimensional shape or a four-dimensional shape. And you can do those first two, but you just can't do the second one because we live in a three-dimensional world and our brains are built for a three-dimensional world. And even though four-dimensional entities are just as real and just as sensible to think about in geometry, um, it turns out that the way that, uh, that our spatial brains work isn't built for that. Um, and there's some things that are even a little bit more specific. So like my expectations about what's gonna happen if I drop an object or these, the way these color contrast phenomena work those are the results of the fact that we evolved not just in a three-dimensional world, but a particular world that has gravity and has light that's filtered through an atmosphere with particular chemical composition that means that some kinds of wavelengths of light get through and others don't. Um, and those kinds of evolutionarily determined features of cognition are culturally universal and are um, very difficult to override. And the best way to deal with them, if you have to override them, is by this slow thinking, stopping and using some formal reasoning tool to overcome the answer of that reasoning mechanism. Other things are um, things that we learn, but that we learn over a long lifetime of experience. So norms for things like um, how closely somebody approaches uh, when you're greeting a stranger on the street, or um, uh, what particular facial expressions or eye movements mean in terms of um, what kind of behavior somebody's likely to under in, engage in. Um, those take a long time to learn, but they do vary culturally. Um, so there are big cultural differences, it turns out, in like norms for distance. Or uh, That's actually good. We're going to come back to this in a second. There are, Right. So these big differences in some cultures, standing uh, two feet away um, is really rude. And in other cultures, not approaching to two feet is really rude, right? Those things, if they were learned over a lifetime, they tend to change slower. But if you have a radical enough intervention, like say a pandemic, that means we all have to stand six feet apart, there's gonna be cultural differences in how different groups of people respond to that, but we're all gonna get the memo within a couple of years, right? Um, and then there are things that are much more specific, like, okay, you know, here's how um, we arrange our seating for this class, or here's how, when I go to this uh, new chain restaurant, how we order and pay for our food. We learn those things over a few trials, but we might forget, and they're pretty malleable. So there's a range of these phenomena. Um, and I guess that answers the second question about cultural variability. The ones that are not really baked in by evolution are all culturally variable. That's great. So given that we know this about how our perception is, you know, we can be misled basically when we're looking at these visuals, um, the students want to know then why, if we know that, why isn't that being used and how we're being given information? Why is the news still using these visuals that are misleading? Yeah. So um, the kind of Glib answer says, well, they're illusions. That's what it means to be an illusion. You know, just so um, if, uh, you know, if I go to one of these mystery spot rooms where everything uh, looks like it's the wrong shape, I can know that I'm in a tourist trap and that this is a construction, that, but I can't unsee that. Um, the deeper answer, is that those illusions are not reflections that our 
visual brains in this case are, um, are a buggy mess. What they're showing us is that some of these things are either evolved or learned over long periods of time to produce powerful constraints on our perception and our judgment. And when we see illusions, most of the time, it's because most of the time that bias or that expectation serves us well. And when we see an illusion, it's because we've constructed something that is unusual, right? So um, to take the, the, the case of like the tilted bar graphs, it's usually not the case that you have, so usually when you have um, a set of oriented lines and then an edge, those are because they're, you've got two different objects and you've got a, a boundary of them. And, it, and it's good to have a contrast uh, enhancement that doesn't confuse those. But when we set up these bar graphs where the tilts are going in opposite directions, those, those constraints uh, lead us astray. So in the case of COVID, do you think that the, because this sort of information is being shared with the public and the public doesn't know how to process it properly, do you think that's adding to hysteria or do you think it's adding to people not doing what they need to do to deal with the pandemic? What's the effect? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so, you know, we touched on how um, social influences can affect our reasoning and decision making. And, you know, the key to that ash conformity paradigm where people judge this bar to be the wrong height because the people around them are judging it to be the wrong height. There's a big emotional component to that. It just feels very uncomfortable when what your eyes are telling you doesn't match what your friends are telling you. Um, and so replacing a um, fast, fluid, but erroneous judgment with a better informed, slower, more accurate judgment that conflicts with maybe what you want or maybe what you believed for several days in a row, that can be very uncomfortable to people. Um, and I think part of what we have to do as communicators and models and policymakers is help people manage changes in their beliefs as new information comes in. That's good. Yeah. So because that leads into another question that a lot of students have is, you know, how do we handle this? How can we learn to mm -hmm. which which information is is reliable, which one's giving us the wrong message? It sounds to me like part of it is slowing down and kind of um, analyzing how you're interacting with that information. Is that yeah. right? As a consumer of these things, I mean, the first thing is just stop and think. Um, you know, when you have the opportunity, stop and think. Um, and sometimes that thought process can lead to, um, okay, here's how to use my fast, rapid uh, decision processes, like say my ability to rapidly extract information from a map or a graph. Here's how to use that to come to accurate judgments. And then I can go ahead and proceed and use that in you know watching. So once I learn how to use a visualization and I've stopped and thought enough so that I know that I understand the visualization properly and I know that it's not biasing me in a pernicious way, then I can consult, you know, like look at all 50 states. I can look at the day to day after day and I don't have to do that stopping and thinking each time. Um, but, the, but the first thing to do is to stop. And, and the second thing to, to think about, I think is, you know, to, is for us to think about these things as communicators. Like when we're talking to our friends and colleagues, when we're making visualizations, um, how am I communicating the information and is it being done in a way that's gonna produce um, a biased judgment or an accurate judgment? Um, is it conveying the conceptual message that I'm trying to convey? And for lots of these things, it's totally true for data visualization. Um, just running little experiments, uh, just trying it a few different ways and seeing what works. You know, is, is a bar graph or a line graph going to work better here? Is a pie chart going to work better? No, a pie chart's never, by the hot tip, two hot tips for today, like 
Don't use legends and don't use pie charts. Um, if you learn nothing else today, those are two good take homes. But you know, you can do the experiments. You can just try these things out on your friends and family. And um, it doesn't take a lot of data to learn whether a communication is effective and accurate or misleading and ineffective. And so some students are wondering, how does this work with accessibility? So for example, for the visually impaired, how do you communicate the, the, this information? Yeah, that's great. Um, so, you know, um, for like color and brightness, uh, you've got to bear in mind that um, a substantial proportion of the American population is uh, colorblind. So you could either be, most of us have three families of color receptors, but a lot of us only have two and some only have one. And so people with two or one uh, sets of color receptors in their eyes perceive color differently. And in recent years, tools for checking your website or your paper or your graph um, to show you what it's going to look like to someone who's colorblind have become widely available. If you just Google, you'll find stuff. Um, and there are um, other, there are lots of other um, tools for checking accessibility of visual displays. And then, but there, you know, there are other issues um, that come up and a lot of them are really being highlighted in COVID times because we have to rely so much on, um, on screens and screens are not accessible to everybody. Yep, exactly. Related to that, because the students are um, doing assignments that involve creating um, visuals, you mentioned don't use uh, pie graphs and don't use legends. I'm, I'm going to take that to heart also myself in my research. <laughs> um, do you have any other tips for them in terms of like how to, to, how to create these visuals that will help to accurately convey the information that they're trying to convey and not lead to this misperception? Yeah, so for graphs, um, a number of us have written like accessible reviews for, um, for people who are making graphs. Um, Steve Frankenary and I wrote a paper recently um, called something like Designing uh, Graphs for Decision Makers. And, um, and I can, the, the, if we make the slides available, I'd link to some of that stuff in, in the figures and I can, I can give you links to those. I, yeah, I think that I may actually have that in the course materials, but I'll check okay. and make sure that it's there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's one thing. Um, and um, uh, and there are a couple um, good books out on on visual design, um, and so those are those are another thing. But I really want to emphasize, you know, there are two ways in which a cognitive scientist can try to be helpful in uh, helping people with their designs. One is by telling you about general principles that we've learned about the visual brain. And I've tried to do some of that here. The other is to tell you about some of the methods. And that's you know, this thing that I was just mentioning about running little informal experiment, experiments. Honestly, I think that at least as valuable as any kind of general rules of thumb that I can give you is to tell you that like collecting data, an ounce of data is often worth a gallon of theory. Um, so if you're not sure whether to do A, B, or C, try A, B, and C and show it to a few people. It doesn't have to be a big, fancy, statistically controlled experiment. That's great. So given that we may not be perceiving what we're supposed to be getting out of the visuals that we've seen about the pandemic, um, the students wanted to know then, is it the case that the infection rates in the U.S. are getting higher or are they getting lower? Have we been misdirected. No, so right now, if you, um, here, and I'll, I'll go back to the very first graph that I showed and share that with you. Thank you. Um, Okay, so here are those from the New York Times. And what they're plotting is each bar 
is the number of new cases on a given day. And then this line is a smoothed version of those data, averaging, computing a seven day running average. And, um, and what this is showing is that we had this rapid exponential growth in, increase, and then uh, things stabilized and started drifting down. And then in mid-June, and this was happening mostly in the Northeast, these cases were coming mostly from the North, Northeast, and then in, in June and July, we had cases coming from the Southeast and other in California and other places that um, drove us back into another uh, steep growth phase. And now it's leveled off and is drifting down again. So in terms of new infections per day, we're currently on a downward trend. Of course, the cumulative number of cases is always going to be increasing. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's the, um, that's the, plot that a lot of us were looking at, those are the plots that a lot of us were looking at the beginning, and those are the ones that take off suddenly and go through the roof. And I mean, importantly, in the, in the um, models that you played out where you had the different colored dots that were infecting each other, um, you know, one thing that's still to be seen with this is if there is immunity for how long, and so it isn't the case that it's just all going to become purple in the end, right? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And there I'm going to defer to your other. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm think. saying it. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think related to, to trying to understand this and make sure that accurate information is being used, some of the students were wondering, is it the case that we need more people from STEM to be in government so that we can be understanding these processes better? That's a softball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I mean, what, what am I going to say? I'm in STEM and I care about policy and I've seen lots of horrible policy made uh, by not um, tracking reality. Yes. Yeah, we'll just accept the opportunity to make that statement, you know? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, um, we're starting to wrap up here. So uh, one thing that I've been asking people is if there was something that you could say to the students that you haven't already said in terms of you know, we're about to come back to campus probably um, in a few weeks. What are the things you think they should really be thinking about? Yeah, so, you know, at the, at the risk of um, proselytizing, let me say that, you know, these fast decision-making processes are one of the other biases we didn't talk about. And I promise you that um, uh, Professor Milich didn't like tee this up for me. I'm, this just occurred to me when she asked the question, but one of the biases that we didn't talk about is called accessibility bias. When we go look to estimate um, the magnitude of something, we're very much uh, influenced by what we can see right now, what's readily accessible, or what comes to mind when we think about something. And um, most of the time, that's a good idea. So like, if you want to know, like, you know, how snowy is it? and you look around out the window, that's gonna tell you how snowy it is. If you wanna know, um, uh, you know how many people are wearing hats and you look around, that's gonna tell you. Um, but if you're trying to judge uh, how much do I have to worry about getting infected by an invisible microorganism, accessibility is not a super helpful thing. And so, you know, if we're all thinking about our behaviors, I know that for myself, you know, when I get out of the car, I don't see anybody around who, who looks sick. And so it's easy to say, I don't need to pull on my mask. Or, you know, um, or if, you know, if I'm considering going to a party, it, you know, it's easy to say to myself, you know, I haven't really heard much about people being sick. I'm not too worried about it. Um, and that's it, precisely when thinking fast and slow is super important. If you slow down and you think to yourself, oh, okay, I'm right now probably subject to an accessibility bias. And what I wanna do is I wanna think about um, what I know about the current case rates and the infectivity and the modeling. And I wanna uh, think about what those uh, scientific data mean in terms of public policy for being able to keep campus open and being able to protect my uh, parents. Um, so, 
So that's worth thinking about. That's wonderful. Thank you. Sure. And thank you so much for being here. This was really great. I think that this has probably helped the students a lot. Thank you. Good. Good. Thanks for having me. Of course. And to everyone else, we've made it through the first week of the pandemic science and society. Congratulations. I think this has been an amazing week of speakers. Um, you, I hope you have a great weekend. Remember that your introduction survey is due tonight and then you should definitely keep up with all the deadlines that are coming in the days following. Uh, so enjoy your weekend. I will see you on Monday. Until then, stay safe.